Now, results for the first round of Madagascar's presidential polls have been made official today by the country's election body. Now, last week, the National Electoral Commission announced that André Rajoelina won 39% of, percent of the vote and Marc Ravalomanan received 35%. And both, of course, are former presidents. Because neither candidate got over 50% of the vote, they'll meet each other in a runoff on the 7th of December. But the other 34 candidates, including the former president, are are challenging the result at the country's highest court. Madagascar has been beset by political turmoil since regaining independence from France in 1960, including a coup in 2009. Now, to help us dissect that medley of statistics, we're joined in the studio by Tilavina Andrea Misaina, and uh, you're an Africa Deal advisor for the consulting firm KPMG here in Paris. Uh, thank you for joining us on the programme. Thank you for having me here. And... First, however, I'm going to turn to my colleague, and that is Rosie Collier, who has been reporting on a troop of minstrel performers, if you can believe it, from Madagascar, who've been touring here in France. So this is all coming together nicely today. Uh, but first, tell us about who these people are. So this particular troupe that I met with in Paris a couple of weeks ago go by the name of uh, Rasselau Kavia, and uh, they're led by an elderly woman called Pakret uh, Rasselau, so she shares the name of this company. Essentially, they are minstrels who travel the length and breadth of the island, uh, performing at country fairs, burials and ancestral spirit ceremonies. The troop wear brightly coloured uh, clothes and they're influenced actually by their forefathers' contact, I think actually with uh, French traders, mm. because obviously um, French, uh, France uh, colonised the island of, uh, of Madagascar for at least a century, if not two. Um, and then I, therefore, I imagine that there's probably a link between the minstrels that roam the Iberian Peninsula, which is obviously just next door to, to France, uh, between the 12th and 16th century, and those of the modern-day performers in Madagascar, because they play a very similar role. And their instruments are, are Western, as well. Um, members of the troupe play uh, snare drums, trumpets and violins, so not, not necessarily uh, in, instruments that you'd associate with uh, the African continent sure. and, uh, and also the island of Madagascar. And, and what's especially interesting about uh, Pakaret's troupe is that they use uh, performances to name and shame uh, bad apples uh, within a given community. So naming and shaming bad apples, exactly how did they go about this? So every society in the world has its bad apples, whether it be alcoholics, child abusers, drug addicts or uh, wife beaters. But Madagascar is obviously no different in this. But what is novel is the way that Pacret's troop goes about dealing with these kinds of issues. So basically, uh, they go into a given community and meet with the elders who dish the dirt on a particular uh, troublesome individual or individuals in the plural. Then during a given performance, they'll make reference to that individual's dirty deed and um, Pacaret told me actually in the interview I had with her that some people accept what's being said and agree to change their, their ways while others um, can't stand being named and shamed in this way and storm off in a rage um, and so you know, to some extent, Rasselau Kavia, this company uh, or this troop, act like a, a kind of moral police in rural areas. It kind of, it kind of reminds me of Gachacha courts almost, except you know, in a less serious circumstance. Yeah, but still, indeed, it's 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 very much a traditional way of uh, trying to uh, keep the uh, the the community together. Just like let's clear it out in the open. But do they get involved in politics at all? No. So Pakaret was quite clear on that. Uh, I imagine that's because politics. Uh, can be dangerous, uh, you know, in a place like uh, Madagascar, where lots of money is involved. We'll hear about that later from our guests. But, um, but she she seems much more comfortable for her troop to deal with personal politics rather than the bigger issues affecting Madagascar and most members of her troops herself included um, didn't finish school I mean literacy is very high in Madagascar 35 percent of the adult population can't read or write mm. um, they operate on a grassroots level therefore which is important in a place like Madagascar where 80 percent of people still live in rural and semi-rural areas and Hiragasi which is a Malgash name for uh, this genre of performance is performed by the common man and woman uh, for the common man or woman. And woman. Okay, well my thanks there to Rosie Collier uh, for that uh, presentation and of course we can see the video there if you can see us online uh, that video of um, that Malagas, uh, Malagasy troupe uh, is going up online today and 
First, thank you very much for your patience. To our guest in the studio, uh, that's Silavina Andrea Misaina. Uh, I hope I pronounced that all right. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, and you know, of course, Madagascar well. You've spent several years helping small and medium-sized businesses in Madagascar to secure funding. Now, I imagine some of what Rosie explained is quite familiar to you. I mean, let's start, however, with the economy. Uh, Madagascar is one of the world's poorest countries, according to the World Bank. But what are the biggest hurdles to Madagascar's economic development today? It's a really good question, in fact, uh, because um, it's it's a real mystery, to be mm. honest. Um, and some economists uh, talked about um, the Madagasy paradox. Uh, because, in fact, Madagascar um, is, uh, is full of uh, natural resources. Sure. Uh, we haven't been through, uh, like, major civil wars. There were some instabilities, Obviously, but no major civil wars, no major, you know, natural disasters, um, and still uh, the economy is uh, plumbering uh, since at least seventy years. So it's a real mystery, in fact. Um, and for the economists, when they are trying to to explain uh, what happens in Madagascar, um, most of the ex- the explanations are mo- are more around, um, I would say. The corruption, uh, the corruption of the society, uh, the corruption of the elites mm-hmm. also. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the real issue in my view in Madagascar is that um, the top uh, elite of the country is monopoli- monopolizing um, most of the, uh, um, I would say, the, the, the good things in the country, mm. uh, most of the resources, and they don't share it. And they, and they kind of... Um, it, it, it's an av- advantage for them to have this uh, political instability and this low economic development because it enables them to uh, perpetuate uh, this kind of uh, rap, uh, to be honest. And the, the previous president, um, uh, Hedy, he, he, he himself, he was an accountant, but he still wasn't able to turn the country around. So it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean if you're good with a ledger that you're able to make things work. But let's have a look at the two remaining candidates now yeah. that are uh, standing in the presidential race. Uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, André uh, Rajuelina and uh, Marc Ravalamanana. And... Uh, well, Rajwalina, who is one of uh, the youngest, if not the youngest, um, head of state that the Africa has ever seen, who is a former DJ. And you have um, Ravalo Manan, who's known as the milkman because of his, well, he made his money out of selling ice cream and he's invested in, a, in the, 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 the dairy companies in Madagascar. But these are still two old faces in Malagasy uh, politics at this stage. Um, but which one, seeing that you are indeed a consultant with KPMG, which <laughs> one would you deem to be the most business friendly? No, to be honest, um, they are both uh, business friendly. Mm. Maybe a bit too much. <laughs> got you. They're, they're too people fond people of People will say. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, but they are, they, are, they are all business friendly. And um, uh, I would say... Uh, we know on the, on Andre Joel uh, mm. because he was a former DJ, but he was also a former entrepreneur, mm. a successful one. He owned uh, advertising companies uh, that were successful. Um, Mark uh, Mark Havelman mm. obviously is a su- successful entrepreneur too. So from a business side, I'm not sure there will be an issue. Um, the question is more: um, Will it be? Uh, will the business that they will develop for Madagascar, will the economic development of Madagascar really impact the basic population? You see what I mean? Uh, will we be able to finance like basic social needs? Will we be able, will this new president, and the question is, uh, is real for the two of, the, of them, will they be able to finance hospitals, to finance schools, uh, will, 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 will the new president be preoccupied uh, about those kind of issues? Well, there are a lot of promises on the hustings about re- improving infrastructure uh, and you know, building sports stadia, etc., etc. But yet again, this presidential contest up until now has been known as the battle of the exes because they're both ex-presidents. What is different in Madagascar's economy now that they didn't fix maybe, uh, let's just say, five or ten years ago? It's also a good question. In fact, respectively, <laughs> in, in fact, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, the situation is w- was better. Yeah, uh, the situation is not better than uh, a few years ago. Um, but 
I think that um, maybe um, we, we are in a, in, a, in a good time right now because uh, the investments uh, worldwide to Africa are increasing. And particularly myself, I have a lot of clients that ask me about how is Madagascar doing. And in fact, the question is not, uh, will the new president uh, um, be, uh, will, will the new president orient uh, this kind of investment? But more, will we have the political stability to enable the people to come and to invest and the country to develop itself and the corruption to be lower? And will the president uh, uh, will, it, will it take those opportunities to invest in social needs? And also it's to, to gain the confidence of external investors to come and stay and exactly. invest in Madagascar. Exactly. Now, millions of euros have been spent by the candidates themselves on their campaigns. And we have reported on the use of helicopters ferrying candidates to campaign rallies and thousands of T-shirts being given away to voters. How do ordinary Madagascans, most of them who live before, below the poverty line, feel about this kind of over-the-top campaign spending, if you would? You know what? I think that they are very happy hmm. about it. They are very happy because it's an opportunity for them. You know, when you are paid to assist a meeting, to attend a meeting, well, you come, you get one day paid. Yeah. And your family is <laughs> as, 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 as enough to eat that day. So you are very happy with that. And, and they are not naive, in, in, in fact. But that, that, I mean, that in itself is a bribery. It's, it's, it's like paying yeah, people yeah, to be there. That's the reality. But can they go, can they go to one camp, campaign rally for uh, Ravalo Manan and one uh, for Rajalin exactly, the next day? Exactly. <laughs> so they, 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 that's they, what happened. They run with the hair and the hands at the same yeah, time. Exactly. That's what happened. But they, realistically speaking, um, they are being realist, realistic. Sure. Um, in fact, most of the people, including the people in the rural areas, and you say that m around 50% pe pe of the people in Madagascar comes from uh, rural areas. Um, in fact, they don't really believe that uh, one president or another will change the situation. So real politics really just breaks in. It's basically... <laughs> exactly. And it's sad. Yes. It? It's, it, they, they, they're not, they haven't got much faith in it. But I mean, we can actually look back to the rivalry between these two main candidates uh, that date back to that coup d'etat back uh, 10 years ago in 2009. Um, just can you briefly explain what happened and how do you think their rivalry is going to play out in the next week in the, in the run-up to the second round of elections? Um, well, in 2009, um, Mark Havalmanen was uh, in the power. It was his uh, second mandate. Uh, and uh, Andra Zuelen was the mayor of the, the capital, uh, the city centre, um, Antananarivo. And uh, due to, uh, I would say, several issues, I don't want to go too the much details, into details, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Raval, um, Radzuelna took the power uh, help, uh, with the help of uh, the militaries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Mark Ravelman has to leave, to leave the country and uh, he went to South Africa. Um, and basically, since then, uh, Mark Ravelman always wanted to go back and to take back the power, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and Andrew as well wanted to perpetuate his regime. Uh, but uh, since the, um, the funders, the international funders, uh, didn't really accept it, the fact that uh, he came with a coup. Well, yeah, he wasn't mandated really by the exactly, people indeed. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so this, this time, uh, it's really the, the revenge uh, of the two. And the, the, I think that for a lot of people in the, in the different camps, um, in the two different camps, uh, some of them have, have been really extremized. You, you say extremized? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Extreme, yeah. yeah. yeah they, they are really extreme in their mm -hmm. position. And I really hope that those parts of the different camps will not, uh, uh, will not triumph, in fact. Uh, and we, we, really, uh, we really want, I think, as, as average people, uh, only the stability, in fact.
You want the stability and not the rhetoric. And that's uh, exactly. Okay. Well, look, I am going to leave it at that. Uh, my thank you very much uh, to Silavina Andrea Misaina. Thank you very if much. If that's how I pronounce it properly. Uh, you are indeed Africa Deal Advisor for the consulting firm KPMG. And thank you for coming to our studios today. And of course, to my colleague Rosie Collier. And you can read more about Madagascar's name and shame minstrels, Rasoa Lalau Kavia. Is that how I'm yeah, pronouncing it? Kavia. Kavia yeah. is the way of it. Yeah. And of course, that is going to be on our website uh, where we've also posted a video of the troops leader Pacaret. So you can get that all on RFIEnglish.com. Thank you both for being on Paris Live. Thank you, David.